ourselves in discussions with those ignorant who profess to know more than us. Now, it's not speaking of just servants in verse 9. What is in verse 10 is not restricted to what's in verse 9. But it deals and it addresses all those who are in the Christian resistance. And it says, we are that way, not secretly. But it has to manifest itself that we are Christians in all good faith. In other words, our faith must manifest itself Since our faith must lead us to press on into the act of submission according to what was declared to us in the declaration. So if we are to perform the works that we are called to by Christ and God, then there must be works manifested if we say that we are Christians. And that is why the verse starts, not secretly. That we may put in proper order the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And you need to focus your attention on the phrase that you may put in proper order the doctrine of God our Savior. Underline for me please the phrase the doctrine of God our Savior. It is in fact what I am speaking of this morning to indicate to you that God Himself became our Savior and our Deliverer. But remember, if we are to interact with God, God had to exist first in a state that was short of his own glory because we cannot see God and live. We cannot be exposed to the full glory of God and live. The glory of God would consume us. And that is the reason why God had to shed his glory so that we could approach him. Now, I believe I'm speaking in plain English language. So, there shouldn't be anything that you're not understanding at the present time. It says clearly, the doctrine of God, our Savior. And it does not restrict, it doesn't restrict it in any way to the physical Jesus. As a matter of fact, since we recognize that Jesus was a physical manifestation in the world of who God was, then we can, by no stretch of the imagination, equate Jesus with God. For if Jesus were in fact God in existence, in his glory, he would have consumed his mother Mary and if she had survived that experience then God would have consumed the entire physical universe at his birth. Now the essence of what is being communicated in verse 10 is underlined by what at the beginning of verse 11 for the grace of God that delivers now we understand grace to be God's divine influence on us that we can be party to because of the essence of God existing in lack to assume us into himself so that we can be baptized into him for the experience of the glory of God 
while we are hidden him. So the reality of grace dictates, makes it necessary for there to be a reality where God does not exist in his glory. And that reality is identified in the term Christ Jesus, which term is colored by the physical manifestation of the Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth. What gives depth to verse 10 when it speaks of the doctrine of God our Savior is what Paul uses at the beginning of verse 11 when he speaks of for the grace of God. Now the grace of God makes it necessary, dictates that there has to be a deliverer in fact in existence outside of the realm of time which is called the physical universe and which we understand to be in the eternal realm teaching us that denying wickedness and worldly loss we should live soberly in essence recognizing the full impact of the decisions we make on ourselves and on those surrounding us that whatever decision we make we are aware of the impact it may have on those around us and that we restrain ourselves in cases where our decisions will have an evil or harmful effect on those around us that we always think in this way righteously and godly in this present world looking for what we hope to accomplish permanently which is the glory of the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ which brings to our understanding that Paul is hinting at the reality that Jesus and God and glory is one person that there's no separation between these two all of this exists in the backdrop of Titus 1.15 which says unto the healed all works are pure but unto them that are defiled and untrustworthy is nothing pure remembering that our healing takes place in the eternal realm and if we are spiritually connected or baptized into Christ Jesus whatever physical work is being manifested in the world also spoken of in Titus 2.10 that if we are spiritually connected to Jesus Christ are baptized and therefore manifest a physical expression that that physical expression is pure and from God on the other hand if we are not healed if we are not under the influence of grace Titus 2.11 then it means that our lust is intact it means our physical condition is intact it means our natural inclinations are intact it means we are separated from God it means we can't approach Christ Jesus if we are defiled if we are not healed, if we are separated from the eternal realm and untrustworthy because Christ has declared to us 
but we have rejected him then no matter what we do in this world whether it be water baptism whether it be memorizing the entire Bible nothing is pure it's plain it's all interrelated and also if you look at Titus 3 5 to 7 it brings more pressure on us to recognize the essence of the doctrine of God our Savior and how we are delivered because we can experience God because he exists in a state of lack so that we can approach him and not be destroyed by our approach to him Christ's compassion and sympathy were activated because of his understanding of our natural condition with our lust and natural instincts but Christ's own experience as Jesus only meant that he understood the general context of the natural condition his own experience as the son of man did not yield knowledge regarding our individual and particular weaknesses in order for Christ to be able to deliver each son he had to have knowledge regarding each son and his own experience as man did not provide this knowledge Christ's knowledge of the natural condition that he attained by his own experience as a son of man that he foreknew before the physical creation prompted Christ's compassion and sympathy and this knowledge prompted him in the direction of mercy but this knowledge was not enough to activate mercy the knowledge of the general and broad understanding of man's natural condition was not sufficient to bring about Christ's ability to clear to declare to us nor was it sufficient to bring about the creation of the individual spiritual creation required as the antidote for our individual weaknesses and sin Christ had to be in a state of existence just like ours if he were to have the ability to deal with us since Christ exists outside of the realm of time then he would have had to take on all the individual weaknesses and sin of all sons before the physical creation so that he would be ready to declare to us once time begun what Christ did before he began these works was to assume on himself as our prototype all our individual weaknesses and sin he then subverted our individual weaknesses and sin which was the model he started with and ended with the creation of the original spiritual creation it is this original spiritual creation that Christ reveals to us in the declaration but he can only declare to us because he continues to exist in a state similar to ours and different from his original state of glory what I am saying is that for Christ to express mercy to us which was the realization of the intent of compassion and sympathy Christ had to exist in a state that is eternal go quickly with me if you can please to John 12 34 where it says the people answered him we have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever and how says thou the son of man must be lifted up who is this son of man obviously 
they cannot understand what Jesus is saying please also turn with me to Psalm 8936 89 and verse 36 his seed shall endure forever and his throne as a son before me verse 37 it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven Psalm 110 and verse 4 the Lord had sworn and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek looking again at John 12 34 Jesus was speaking to the people and it is billed as Christ's final discourse to the people and the people answered him we have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever now it seems plain especially in Psalm 89 verse 36 and 37 that it is an indication of a king ruling forever however Psalm 89 36 and 37 does not take into consideration the cost to God for being our deliverer forever and this cost we must impute into John 12 34 and also in Psalm 110 4 there is a cost to God scripture usually looks at Jesus reigning forever from the perspective of it being something positive whereas the point I am presently making to you is that there was a cost to God and this cost is very plain in John 12 34 where we expect the entire world to understand and Jesus asserted in himself that our deliverer lives forever outside of the realm of the physical world yet it is difficult for us to understand because we don't seem able to impute in our own minds this reality of God existing in lack Please turn with me again to Hebrews 5 Hebrews 5 1 to 6 where the writer addresses the issue of Christ being quote unquote a high priest after the order of Melchizedek a reference that is also made in Psalm 110 and verse 4 Hebrews 5 1 to 6 deals with the reality of a certain aspect of the function of Christ Jesus as he abides in the eternal realm and looking at it 
from the standpoint of the law the law and this perspective can in no wise constrain or limit the existence of our eternal deliverer by the by the bare fact that it is something that is written in scripture what I'm saying is that this reference to Christ Jesus our deliverer in Psalm 110 verse 4 on which Hebrews 5 6 is based can in no wise restrict the essence of the eternal spirit Christ Jesus as he continues to abide in the eternal realm and it cannot restrict it by anything that is written in the verse these verses only attempt and intend to communicate or express to us a certain aspect of the reality of the existence of God in a state of lack that we must understand in our own minds if you turn with me to verse 11 you will see that the writer of Hebrews was also having some difficulty in getting through to those he had spoken to before there was some difficulty in the audience of the letter of Hebrews in this same aspect that some of you are having difficulty with presently just for comparison I would like to read to you as an exhibit or as an example of what the wider church teaches on Hebrews 5 by quoting you from Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible on verse 5 it says the man Jesus Christ was also appointed by God to this most awful yet glorious office of being the high priest of the whole human race thou art my son the commentary in verse 6 says he saith also in another place, that is in Psalm 104, a psalm of extraordinary importance containing a very striking prediction of the birth, preaching, suffering, death, and conquest of the Messiah. Thou art the priest forever, as long as the sun and moon endure, Jesus will continue to be a high priest to all the successive generations of men as he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world now there appear to be many contradictions in this commentary the first one is that if Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world then obviously it is not speaking of the physical Jesus but of some greater reality that appears to be eluding Adam Clark if in fact Jesus the physical man is this high priest after the order of Melchizedek well then the contradiction here is that 
Jesus had a fixed amount of years in which he endured this physical realm therefore the physical Jesus himself could not be this high priest after the order of Melchizedek there's something missing there since we recognize that Christ having been implanted in the womb of Mary inherited the nature of man from Mary and that he endured and suffered through this experience until his death on the cross therefore the high priest can never be this physical man Jesus of Nazareth and we are not to confuse the eternal Christ our deliverer with the physical man Jesus repeating myself again the physical Jesus is only a shadow Turning now to Hebrews 7.28 I'm not going to continue with Hebrews 5.1-6 because I dealt with it exhaustively last week just quickly looking at Hebrews 7.28 for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity now remember high priests could never in any way provide deliverance for men which is suggested by the law the law suggests to us that the sacrifices that were made on behalf of himself and on behalf of the people forgave their sin now what I'm saying to you we cannot assume that even though the law suggests that we cannot assume that that is in fact the truth of the reality as it's being suggested by God in fact God's intention is for us to recognize that the eternal spirit Christ Jesus is the one who is shadowed in the essence of the high priest and it is not the high priest who forgives our sins or who gets forgiveness for our sins because of the sacrifices performed on our behalf but rather that it is Christ Jesus who delivers us from our weaknesses and that Christ Jesus is only represented in the high priests for the law maketh men high priests and the law made men high priests after the instructions of God 
to indicate to us this reality that the high priest is only a shadow for one particular aspect of the essence of the reality of who Christ is as God in lack for the purpose of delivering us from our weaknesses full stop we ought to develop to such an extent in our thoughts that we recognize exactly what God is communicating in any particular verse and it was not God's intention that men's sins could be forgiven by the sacrifices that were offered up by high priests on our behalf because men cannot gain for other men the forgiveness of sins it takes God himself to forgive us our sins and the only way that our sins or our weaknesses can be wiped away is because God exists in a state of lack to deal with us lepers approached Jesus as he walked on his way and it was against the law for lepers to approach any man much less Jesus who was understood to be a priest or a teacher sent from God by the people of Israel and this this reality of lepers having approached Jesus simply represents to us the reality of our approaching God since he exists in our lack for the purpose of giving us strength and might in our own natural condition even if it is a state that is only temporarily it says in Hebrews 7.28 in the second part but the word of the oath which was in the law made the son who is consecrated forevermore now it can't be that we still believe that the physical Jesus was consecrated forevermore and I've said to you this is just using words to describe that which is impossible to speak of and where it says but the word of the oath indicates a particular work of God that he did in himself by his own power which could not be changed because once he entered into our state of lack at the beginning of the age of the prototype he could not return in essence to his glory without there being in fact an age where he continues to exist in this lack once he took on himself a change in the eternal realm it in fact could not be erased and had to exist from that time onwards using time in the manner of men this is the dedication of God that having recognized what it would take to deliver his sons from the natural condition 
in the physical realm he proceeded to dedicate or consecrate himself while knowing that he would have to remain in that state forevermore from that point onwards that's the kind of dedication that God brought to the New Testament and that's the kind of dedication that God looks forward to receiving from us that once we dedicate ourselves to this Christian struggle that we remain in it that we don't look back for Christ to express mercy to us Christ had to exist in a state that is eternal and in a similar nature to ours if he were to deal with us without destroying us by the strength and power of his own excellence and perfection therefore this meant that God's full knowledge of the experience of Jesus' earthly expedition in the condition of the natural man could not change Christ God to the extent that we needed him to be changed in fact foreknowledge did not change God's nature in any way it just allowed him to develop compassion and sympathy for the natural condition that mankind would assume because of Adam and it propelled him towards the expression of mercy foreknowledge propelled God towards the act of assuming on himself all our individual weaknesses and sin at the beginning of the age of the prototype and if you turn with me to Isaiah 53 11 something we have studied at length so this is not to go over it but just to remind you of the correct translation full knowledge propelled God towards the act of assuming on himself all our individual weaknesses and sin and we didn't just invent this because it is in the words of Isaiah in 53 11 and 12 <coughs> for Christ shall carry our perversities because he emptied, poured out and demolished his soul or his original essence his glory unto death and from the part where it says and he was numbered with the transgressors and he enrolled himself in lack the correct translation ought to be and he enrolled himself in lack <coughs> and strode into our luck by breaking away from his original essence foreknowledge of his own natural experience as man did not change God but it propelled him in the direction of change foreknowledge gave God the motivation and the will to change his eternal nature to become our eternal Christ and for Christ to express mercy to us he had to exist in a constant perpetual state of lack he not only had to have knowledge of our individual lack but he had to experience this lack firsthand he had to exist in this lack in the age of the prototype and the age of spiritual creation so that he could subvert that being into perfection before the physical creation and then when we are planted in the physical universe declare to us the antidote for our individual weaknesses and sin for him to be able to reach us to interact with us as we existed in sin he had to exist in a similar state of sin and for his declaration to be meaningful to us 
he had to exist united with the spiritual creation that we were before the physical creation which was a subverted version of our natural selves the perverted version having been formed from the ashes of our weaknesses and sin the prototype represented all our weaknesses and sin what I'm saying is that if we do not take advantage of the opportunity to enter into the New Testament by struggling against our natural condition, lust and natural instincts after everything that God did to ensure our deliverance and salvation in the New Testament then we have no one to blame but ourselves for taking the easy way out of the Lord's way also then do not expect that God is going to change his system prepared before the physical creation in order to give you deliverance and salvation and this is the message of Jeremiah 15 where God himself says that he would not alter the New Testament even if Moses and Samuel interceded on behalf of the unrepentant even if Moses and Samuel asked God to deliver those who refuse to struggle against their natural instincts and even if Moses and Samuel interceded for the world right now after the fact of their having departed this life even if Moses and Samuel asked God at this very moment and while they were together eternally before God to deliver some by another way the Lord would still not deliver them Jeremiah 15 1 ends this way my mind could not be told these people cast them out of my sight and let them go this is a universal truth we cannot escape it there is only one way that we can escape oppression in this life and eternal damnation and it is through our accepting Christ Jesus as our eternal deliverer this teaching proves that Jesus experience as man was not the end of God's suffering but just the beginning of his eternal suffering not speaking necessarily in sequential terms but rather in quantity God's eternal suffering cannot be compared with the suffering Jesus experienced in the natural condition and in his passion and crucifixion I am not in any way trying to detract from the suffering of Jesus in this world all I am saying is just as the beauty of Jesus' works cannot be compared with Christ's spiritual works and Christ's glory so too the suffering of the Son of Man cannot be measured against the eternal suffering of the eternal Christ and if we take the suffering of the eternal Christ lightly and do not benefit from this fact to the full extent of our being delivered from our natural condition then know that God will not provide another way out of our sin and we will have to answer directly to God the Lord prepared everything in the arrangement called the New Testament before the physical creation and all we need do is simply seek Christ sincerely reach out to Christ effectively by struggling against all our natural inclinations and instincts so that we can gain entrance into the New Testament for grace which Paul defines for us as the baptism of repetitive regeneration Titus 3 5 to 3 7 I want you to hear me on this one please grace is according to Paul the baptism of repetitive regeneration that ends in our salvation at the end of our lives perhaps you need to look at that verse please in Titus 3 notice the link between by the washing of regeneration or the baptism of repetitive regeneration and grace in verse 7 
and notice the word saved in the middle of verse 5 that we are saved at the end of our lives because of the baptism of repetitive regeneration which is in the King James by the washing of regeneration and this is what defines grace verse 7 Paul says in Titus 3 7 that we are justified by grace that we can know that we do not have to remain in the state of separation from God because we can be healed and we can become aware of the fact that we are healed from a natural condition being healed and being unaware of this fact is not taught in scripture Paul in linking salvation with grace and the baptism of repetitive regeneration indicates quite clearly that grace must end in salvation through what he calls the baptism of repetitive regeneration and baptism of repetitive regeneration is one inclusive block of repeated regenerations making the whole of our salvation which is one unit that baptism of repetitive regeneration is one experience when looked at from the vantage point of eternity by the one saved since all the times of our regenerations are linked in a sequential process prepared from before the physical creation and since once we enter into that process there should be no turning back Paul is defining grace and salvation as the baptism of repetitive regeneration and he speaks of our regeneration in terms of a process that continues for a whole life and refers to it as one experience the experience of repetitive regeneration grace that does not end in salvation is not grace but something else for want of a better word we can call grace that does not end in salvation frustrated grace Galatians 2.21 speaks of frustrated grace grace is a result of our waging the good fight of faith which is a lifelong struggle to keep our faith alive through our resistance to our natural inclinations and grace that is not intertwined with the good fight of faith is not grace but grace frustrated and what does all of this mean and what is the significance of this teaching to our basic understanding of the Hebrew and Greek scriptures how does this teaching impact on our understanding of scripture and of Christ Jesus and I'm really referring to the fact that we have proven that the actual and real foundation for our deliverance from the natural condition is not based on Jesus' natural experience as man but is based on God's own lack in the eternal realm as God received on himself our own weaknesses and sin which existence as Christ we have proven to you from scripture in an age that was created because of this new reality this teaching further confirms that it is not Jesus who saves but the eternal spirit Christ Jesus who delivers us there is just no access to the physical Jesus but we can access the living Christ via his declaration Jesus himself resisted his own natural inclinations right up to the very end as is expressed in the struggle in the garden of Gethsemane Jesus himself needed salvation in this life Jesus himself was not saved in this life if Jesus was saved in this life we would all be damned to eternal hellfire because we cannot attain constant and permanent 
neutralizations of our lust in this life. The fact that Jesus resisted his own natural inclinations is proof that these natural inclinations were still alive right up to the very end of his life. And Jesus' natural inclinations were symptomatic of his natural existence. In other words, Jesus' natural inclinations were proof that his natural condition still prevailed in his life at the end of his life. When we study scripture, we ought to be confident of understanding what Jesus intends to express and to communicate by the said scripture. We cannot rely on other men to give us an experience of healing. That experience can only come from Christ Jesus. And we can only access Christ Jesus if at least we are willing to surrender our lusts. If we decide in our own mind that we are in the business of preserving our own natural inclinations and lusts, then know that we do not stand a chance at receiving the type of life that Jesus intended for us to have after he foresaw the fall of Adam from grace. We have to at least be determined within ourselves that we are willing to surrender our lusts. That's the first step. If that is the case, then we must proceed in a practical way to restrain ourselves from our natural inclinations that are derailing us and keeping us separated from God. Of this by now we must be sure. What I have also said that I need to underline and underline very carefully is that we accept the fact or we accept the reality that Jesus in fact was fully man if we accept that fact that Jesus son of man Jesus of Nazareth was fully man then we have to recognize that he was in existence like any other man in a natural condition which is controlled by lust natural inclinations and the reality that all of this entails we can't escape this fact if you prefer to hide from the essence of Jesus being fully man then you can also say that while being fully man he was at one and the same time fully God. Whereas what I'm saying to you is that Jesus, Son of Man, was fully man and he represented in a physical expression or a physical shadow everything that Christ our eternal deliverer remains to be on the other side that there is a separation between Jesus the physical man and Jesus Christ being fully God 
that we recognize that in this life Jesus came into this world to point us to his being in a state of constant lack in the eternal realm while retaining his authority as God so that he could re-emerge with us in him in his own glory at will for the purpose of yielding to us the higher level of existence that he desired for us in himself as God while recognizing and putting our finger on the fact that Jesus the son of man was fully man I'm here to point out to you that Jesus shadowed the eternal existence of God in lack who existed in that state for the purpose of delivering us and it is about high time that the church turn its eyes away from the physical Jesus and from the beauty of the physical works of the Son of Man and towards the spiritual works of the eternal Savior the eternal Spirit Christ who continues to abide in a state of lack for our benefit what I'm saying is that there's a distinction there is a difference between Jesus the physical man and Christ Jesus the eternal spirit and who Jesus was resurrected as approached the reality of the eternal Christ that reality fully the reason we need the Holy Ghost to translate us to the level of existence of Christ is for that very same reason that the eternal spirit Christ Jesus could not be manifested in a physical sense in this world because of his proximity to the glory of God and hence the need for our translation by the Holy Ghost let me say it for you in another way when Jesus was resurrected in a form that was different from his pre-cross existence when Jesus rose from the tomb on Sunday morning he rose in a state of existence that was different from his eternal existence but it approached that existence it approached that existence but was not the same even though his resurrected body was different from his physical body before the cross it's not confusing what I'm saying is that Jesus was in the natural condition